And then he makes his famous gesture. Well, I don't doubt it, sir. I feel like throwing. I said, I'm going to hit the next pitch ball right past the flagpole. Well, good Lord, it must have been with you. Well, some of you may be familiar with that video, and many of you maybe not. We have so many 20-somethings here that some of you may have no idea what that even was. So how many show of hands, how many of you are like, I have no idea what that even was? So about 20% of the people here have no idea what that was. Well, in the fifth inning of Game 3 of the 1932 World Series, Babe Ruth, and as Steven said this morning when he watched this, he said, wow, he doesn't look like a baseball player. If you know a little bit about the babe, really enjoyed booze, eating, and amongst a lot of other things. So his physique shows that. But in 1932, the babe stepped into the batter's box and he called his shot. So you see him as he signals, he, he says, this one's going out of the park. So he steps into the, into the batter's box, calls his shot. He pointed to the center field bleachers and on the next pitch, he hit a 500-foot dinger past the flagpole and entered into the center field bleachers. Afterwards, Ruth confirmed this is what he did. However, there's been lots of speculation. If you go dig into the internet, there's all kinds of debates about this. On all sides of this argument, is that really what he was doing? Did he really know that he was going to hit a home run here and score a winning run? Or was it just happenstance? So all the speculation is, did he do it, did he not do it? Well, today I want us to consider something much more important, much more critical than Babe Ruth and baseball. And yeah, we're a baseball town, but what we're going to talk about today is way more important than baseball, even in Farmington, New Mexico. So today it is an honor to get to open God's Word with you, and we're going to be in Mark chapter 3. And so if you have a Bible or if you didn't bring one in there, grab that black one in the pew in front of you and grab that out. Our goal as elders at Grace Hill Church is always to drive you to the Word of God. So for you to be Bereans, the Scripture says, to be checking to see what's being preached from the pulpit is actually biblical, it's actually scriptural. So check that. So today we're going to consider three possibilities of who Jesus is. Big deal? Way bigger deal than baseball. I believe that the text will cause us to consider who Jesus is and prove, not debate, but prove the only option is to call him Lord. That Jesus called his shot. He said who he said it was, and that was the Lord Almighty. So if you would, open up your Bible to Mark chapter 3, and we're going to be looking specifically at verses 20 through 30. So we are going to fall a little bit short. I kind of left that end, so Pastor Tim can unpack that next week. And there's actually a lot here. There's probably a couple different directions this sermon could have went as I prayed through this. And so I'm sure as Pastor Tim starts to pray about this next section of text, there may be a different direction that he takes some of this, even maybe even backtracks a little bit, because there's a lot here. But the way we're going to look at this text is see who is Jesus. So follow along with me as we read Mark chapter 3, verses 20 through 30. It says, Then he, referring to Jesus, went home. And the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he's possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out the demons. And he, again referring to Jesus, called them to him and said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand." 
And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man. And whatever blasphemes they utter, but whoever blasphemes the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. So again, today we're going to focus on answering that question. What are the three possibilities of who Jesus was and is? And here are the three possibilities. And you've probably heard this before. If you've read any C.S. Lewis, if you've read Mere Christianity, you've seen this. So C.S. Lewis said, I believe it's going back to this text because we're going to see this in this text today. There's three possibilities of who you can say Jesus is. He's either a lunatic, he's a liar, or he's your Lord. Let that sink in for a minute. Who do you say Jesus is? Was he just a lunatic? A crazy man? Perhaps he was just a liar, just made it all up. Or you have to declare him as your Lord, your only hope for salvation, the place where you put all your hope and trust for tomorrow and eternity. So look at, look at the first possibility. So the first possibility is you say he's just a lunatic. He's a crazy man that lived 33 years, lived to 33 AD, and he was just a lunatic. So let's look at the text. Look at verses 20 through 21. It says, Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. So as we begin our text today, we see that this crowd again, and Pastor Tim unpacked this a few weeks ago, everywhere Jesus goes, and we see this throughout his ministry, everywhere he goes, this crowd is just drawn in. As we looked, the crowd not always there for the right reason. They're not oftentimes there to say, we are here because you are our Lord and you are our master. We will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus told them crazy things, right? If you remember, Jesus told them, yeah, if you'll pick up your cross and follow me. And again, in our culture, we think of a cross as, oh, that's a little emblem we wear around our neck. It says, yeah, yeah, Jesus is our Lord. No, this was an instrument of death. This was a torturous item that the Romans had put in place because they said, this is the most excruciating, brutal, humiliating way to murder somebody. So Jesus tells them, oh, if you want to follow me, pick up your cross and follow me. One of the texts he says, oh, if you want to be, follow me, you need to eat of my body and drink of my blood. These are not ten things that tend to keep a crowd around, right? And oftentimes it says, and the crowd went from him. So oftentimes the crowd is there for the wrong reason. The crowd is there because they think they're going to get something. They're there for the show. They're there for the entertainment. And this happens today too, doesn't it? You can do crazy things and draw a crowd, right? That's pretty simple. So they were there because Jesus was doing miraculous things. He was healing the lepers. He was giving sight to the blind. He was doing miraculous things. So some level, they were just there for the show. So even in our text today, we see there's a crowd. So this crowd has shown up so much that they can't even have a meal. Like, I just want to sit down and have a meal, and there's so much of a crowd like, man, we can't even eat. But here we see Jesus' family showing up. And Jesus' family, I think, is even questioning, who is Jesus? 
As I read commentations, commentators this week, several made reference that his family was probably partially concerned for Jesus' well-being. All these crowds pressing on him, so probably some just level of concern like, man, we gotta get you away just so you can rest. But most of them thought that probably more concerned about their family reputation. And we do this, don't we? Anybody got that crazy uncle? You want to just keep him at a distance because if people know that he's family, it may reflect on me. You got that guy, right? Or maybe that aunt. Could go either way, couldn't it? Cousin. Then it affects your reputation. So they're saying, we got to do something different. So in verse 21, we see the quotes of the family saying, he is out of his mind. This is Jesus' own family. This is the same verb that we see in Acts chapter 26, verse 24. We see it in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 13. Esteemi is the word in the Greek. And it actually means to stand outside oneself. So the physical body and mentally he's outside himself. Doesn't that sound a lot like they're saying he's a lunatic? They're saying he's a crazy man. He is out of his mind. So perhaps that's the conclusion. That's where you can come to today that, well, Jesus was just a lunatic. He's just a madman. He declares himself to be God. So he must be a lunatic. Now, I'd argue that his mother knew differently, amen? Amen. So Mary knew differently, and how did Mary know differently? Because she'd been told by God the Father, by the Holy Spirit, firsthand. We see this in Luke chapter one, verses 26 through 33, and those scriptures will be up on the board. It says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greetings this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. I think there was probably lots of times that Mary went back to the call. This is something that in pastoral ministry that often be said to you is go back to your call. Pastoral ministry is not always easy. Eric and I were at a, at a conference one time and we heard Matt Chandler of the Village Church say something that you envision when you get into pastoral ministry that you're gonna spend all your time with the good sheep. Loving them, studying the Bible, praying, it's just gonna be a ton of fun. But what he said is the reality is that's not where you're gonna spend your time. You're gonna spend your time with the bad sheep. Out on the fringes with a stick, beating them back in, dragging them back to the fold. So oftentimes pastoral ministry is hard. And let me not even say pastoral ministry, ministry is hard. And again, ministry is not for some group of elite people. Everybody here is called into ministry. As a believer in Christ, this is what you're called to. You're called to do hard things. Scripture tells us, make disciples. This is not the edict for pastors, this is the edict for all believers. So ministry is hard. People will fail you. But when you love people well, it's beneficial for the kingdom. So I believe this is part of what Mary probably had to do at times whenever some of the family saying, you know, Jesus is just crazy. No, he's not God in the flesh. He's not God among us. He must just be crazy. My guess is she went back to her call. I would encourage you to do the same thing. Go back to your call. 
Again, when you go to the conferences, that's what they'll say is, go back to when God called you to ministry. Go back to when God saved you. Because when things get hard, you go back and go, oh God, I remember these things that I know the only explanation is you did that for me. Because when things get hard, you need something to hold on to. What we hold on to is Christ and what he's done for us. So whether that's ministry, hard days, we say, God, you are my rock and whom I'm going to stand upon. And I believe that Mary was doing the same thing. She would go back to, well, I remember an angel came in. I was a virgin. I gave birth to a baby, and I know all that's true. So I'm going to go back and hold on to that. I think we have other family members that experience similar things, right? Mary's cousin Elizabeth, who gave birth to John the baptizer. We see this in Luke 1 as well. We did see several months back, as Pastor Tim unpacked Mark chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, John the baptizer knew that he was strictly a precursor to Christ. He knew who he was. I don't believe that this family that's talking about here was John. Family mentioned could have been a lot of people, but not John. Some of the conversations said at this time, he would have either been in prison or already been beheaded. So he wouldn't have been one of these family members that were saying Jesus is just out of his mind. Because this is what John said in Mark chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. He said, and he preached, saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He knew that Jesus was the Christ. John was also there at the baptism of Jesus. Can you imagine that experience? When Jesus says, John, I need you to baptize me. And he says, I'm not worthy to untie your sandal, much less baptize you. But in that, as he submerges Jesus and he comes up, he hears God the Father say, this is my son. This voice from heaven audibly saying, this is my son. And physically sees the Holy Spirit ascend upon Christ. It says, like a dove. Would these be memories you would hold to? These would be those memories that you would, you would hold fast to whenever you're like starting to question, maybe I'm just crazy. Maybe Jesus is just crazy. No, I saw this with my own eyes. I saw how God, the Holy Spirit, God the Father spoke to me. How he spoke to Jesus and we heard this. So I started thinking, perhaps this family Maybe it was his half-brothers and sisters. You know, siblings always have interesting dynamics, right? So Matthew 13, 53 through 57, I think maybe gives us an idea that possibly that's who this was. So Matthew 13, 53 says, And when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there, and coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished and said, Where did the man get this wisdom in these mighty works. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many works there because of their unbelief. Oof. There's pros and cons to doing ministry in your hometown, right? See, as elders, we're kind of a different group. I grew up in Farmington. Tim grew up in Bloomfield. Stephen grew up in Aztec. That's kind of rare in San Juan County. As transient as San Juan County is with the oil filled in and out, it's rare to have local guys the good news, bad news is there's lots of people that knew us as kids. <laughs> Some people knew us as teenagers and like, hey, I can't imagine that guy doing ministry. Amen? So maybe on some level it's harder. It's easier to go into a brand new city and be like, hey, this is who I am today. So on some level maybe it's harder to, again, for a prophet to do ministry in his own town. 
we would argue there's a benefit to it. The benefit that there's lots of people that you knew and you can say, look what Christ did as he changed me, as he transformed my life. Because yeah, you knew me then, but look what Christ did. Not look what I did, look what Christ did to change and transform me. So again, pure speculation, but my thought is that, yeah, who these people were, they're saying, yeah, he's out of his mind. They're probably his half-siblings. They're probably his brothers and sisters. I got to think, can you imagine being the sibling of Christ? Why can't you be more like your brother Jesus? He doesn't lie. He doesn't disobey. Well, except for that one time when we were leaving Jerusalem and he stayed back. We had to go back and find him. It turned, like he, it turned out he was astounding all the, the elders and, the, and all the Pharisees. There was that one time. But can you imagine being Jesus' sibling? That's hard territory, right? Talk about a hard shadow to live in. So perhaps just thinking he was crazy, maybe it just made life easier as his brother. Maybe he's saying, you know what, he's just a crazy man. So yeah, all the stories that mom has told us, all those things, maybe they're not true. So let's just say he's crazy, then we don't have to buy into the reality of it. I would say, however, if this is true, I want you to know that there's been a change of heart. That we see a change of heart from this time in the writing in the Gospels to namely the writing of the book of James and the book of Jude. So James and Jude were Jesus' half-siblings, the sons of Mary and the sons of Joseph. James becomes the leader of the church in Jerusalem and writes the book of James, and in it he professes Jesus as Lord. Not Jesus as lunatic, but Jesus as Lord. We also see it in the intro to the book of Jude. So Jude 1 says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. May peace, mercy, and love be multiplied to you. So here we see family moving from Jesus has no honor. We don't give him any honor. As it says in Matthew, it's saying, really, he just must be out of his mind. In today's text as well, to writing books of the New Testament, declaring Christ as Lord. We see it in James 1.1 as well, where it says, James, a servant. Or this would just be more than a servant, be a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So how many of you have siblings who are willing to call themselves your slave? My guess is very few. So I have one brother, one younger brother, and probably the very, very last thing he would call me would be his master. The very, very last thing he would choose to do would be my slave, especially after I'm dead and gone. We have four girls in our house. My guess the very last thing they would do for one another is call one of them Lord. Normally it's more of a battle of who's in charge. I guess if you're raising kids, I can get an amen, right? This is not something siblings do on their own accord. Siblings don't just be like, oh yeah, yeah, that, that older brother of mine, he, he, he's my master, he's my Lord. I'm gonna be a slave to his teachings. And you just put it in reality, it's funny, right? It's funny to think about it in those terms. So something changed, right? So something changed in these guys' lives. What changed is he was murdered on a cross. He was buried and he resurrected. And he appeared and showed them the nail-scarred hands and they said, this is our Lord. This is the Christ of Scripture that fulfilled all of the prophecies of the Old Testament. So even as his sibling, I can call him Lord. So I believe that through this scripture is showing he cannot be a lunatic. 
that that's a poor answer. It's maybe a way to excuse the reality of who Christ is, but it's not the reality. And I got to thinking practically, have you met a lunatic? Have you met a crazy person that declares himself to be God? Have you met this guy? We've had this guy show up at Grace Hill Church, actually. Two years ago, three years ago, my years kind of blurred together. He showed up here early before the congregation got here. And he just, he said, hey, I want y'all to, uh, I want you to know I'm gonna need to get up on stage, on the platform this morning and say something. I said, okay, what do you need to say? He said, well, I just need to say something. I said, well, what do you need to say? He said, I need to tell everybody that I'm God. What do you say to that guy? You say no, amen? <laughs> so you say, hey, Brian, I need you to come over. I have something I need you to tell this guy. So I said, let's go ahead and start with no, you're not getting on the stage, and let's go ahead and start with two, you're not God. But he needed to tell everybody he was God. As we visited, there was lots of messed up sin in this guy's life. Wouldn't that disqualify you from being God? Yeah, red flag, right? So as he told his story, pretty messed up, not God. Of course, once he found out that he wasn't going to be able to get up and say anything, he decided to leave. We went ahead and gave him an escort to the end of the parking lot, just, just for safety reasons. But I'll tell you, that you spend a small time around somebody who's out of their mind, who declares themselves to be God, and that interaction lasted about 10 minutes. It didn't take long to realize he was not God. I would say you know pretty quick they're just out of their mind. So is this how you see Jesus? As you read the word of God, do you just see him as a lunatic? What's interesting is that even the hardest atheist won't say this. They won't say Jesus was a lunatic. There's too much historical facts outside of scripture to say Jesus healed, Jesus did mighty works. There's too many of those facts for people to say he's a lunatic. So if it's not that, the next would be to say, well, is he just a liar? That's the next option. I believe that that's what the scribes and the Pharisees came with to attack as we look at our scripture today. So look at verse 22. It says, and the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons, he casts out the demons. So here's the reality. They show up. They can't deny the miraculous things Jesus is doing. They're seeing it firsthand with their own eyes. They can't deny it. So if they can't deny it, what are they going to do about it? The reality is they're not angry because people are getting healed. They're angry because, God, because Jesus is declaring himself Lord, that he's declaring himself to be the Christ. Yahweh, the great I am, as God revealed himself to Israel when, while in Egypt. So what do they do? They have to make something up that's plausible. Well, his ability to teach and heal doesn't make him God. So no, he must just be possessed. He's possessed by Beelzebul. You know, the prince of demons. You know that guy. This was the name of a Canaanite deity. So they just straight out call him a liar. Like, no, you're not God, full of the Holy Spirit, the second member of the Trinity. No, you're this guy. You're just a simple human being possessed by Satan. That's how you do these things. The beauty is Jesus doesn't just remain silent. He gives an answer. He answers it straightforward to him. In verses 23 through 27, we see Jesus' answer. And he called them to him. So he's like, these guys that are making this stuff up, come on, come close. And he said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? 
If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed, he may plunder his house. So his answer, so his answer to them when they say, no, 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 you're not Lord, you're not the Christ, you're not God in the flesh, you're possessed. He says, if that were true, why would Satan cast out Satan? So what you're saying doesn't even make any sense. Your argument and your accusation is foolishness. And Jesus then says it in three ways. He uses a divided kingdom in verse 24. He uses a divided house in verse 25. And then he uses this strongman argument in verse 27. Well, the strongman is Satan, and the stronger one is Jesus. As Jesus was the one that was going to tie up Satan, exercising demons, and there was nothing Satan could do about it. Because you see throughout Scripture where he's casting out demons. Why would Satan do that, right? It's like murdering your own guy, right? No, because God Almighty is opposed to Satan. That's why he cast out demons. So Jesus in his own words here declares, he's not a liar, but he's Lord. And again, I would say rarely does the guy on the street declare Jesus to be a liar. You know, if you ask people, so what do you think of Jesus? You you hear all kinds of things. Oh, he was a good man. He was a prophet. Really, they say, oh, the guy was a liar. I've read the word of God. I've looked historically at Jesus, and he's a liar. That's not what they say. So if he's not a lunatic, and he's not a liar... The only option is he's Lord. So look with me at verses 28 and 29. And we see Jesus declare himself as Lord. So verse 28, Jesus goes on, he says, Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man. And whatever blasphemes they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. So directly after Jesus declares he's not possessed by the deity of the Canaanites, he goes on to tell them about forgiveness of sin. So who can forgive sins? God alone, right? So if only God alone can forgive sins, This is Jesus declaring himself as God. Jesus declaring himself as Lord. And it may seem odd to then bring up the Holy Spirit. I thought as I read this text that he goes on, then all of a sudden he starts talking about the Holy Spirit and blaspheming the Holy Spirit. It's like, why would he do that? I think Jesus is making a point. He's saying, my power doesn't come from some demonic spirit which you're saying about me. No, my power comes from the Holy Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Because the second member of Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, only I can forgive sins. So if he's Lord, what does it mean for Jesus to be your Lord? It's more than just showing up on a Sunday morning More than saying a prayer, yeah, God saved me and so I'm good to go. I get eternity. It's different when you say, Jesus is my Lord. Look at John 14, 1 through 6. It says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, Would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may also be. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is why the religious elites killed Jesus. This is why the world hates Jesus. This is why they want to call him a lunatic. This is why they want to call him a liar. This is why they want to just say he's, he's, just, he's just a good guy or he is, he is a way. No, Jesus is not a way. He is the only way, self-declared the only way. Because we see in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus is the only son, the second member of the Trinity. And yes, no one comes to the Father but by him. Again, many of our world wants to make lots of things of Jesus. Yeah, he was, he was a good dude. He did good stuff. I read one article that said, oh, he was just a really good magician. They want to make a lot of things of him, but they don't want to say he was fully God and fully man. But I think today you have to say, is he Lord or is he a lunatic or a liar? The Muslims say Jesus was not God, nor the Son of God, but really was just a great prophet. So if he was a great prophet and not Lord, but he said he was Lord, so therefore they have to say, well, he's either a lunatic or a liar. The Jews say he was a rabbi, a really popular teacher in his day. Again, if that's what you say he was, you can't say he was a good man and a rabbi because he declared himself as God. So if he declared himself as God, then you have to say he's a liar. This is what all the monotheists say about Jesus. So then we got to look and see what do the polytheists say about him? Polytheists, those that hold to a theology of many gods. So this would be the Buddhist. Well, they say he was an enlightened person, a holy man. The Hindus say, well, he was a holy man and he was a god. So one of many gods, just to add to the mix. This is what the syncretists are good at doing. A lot of native traditionalists will do this. They'll say, yeah, I hold to native traditionalism and I'm good with that. And when they hear the gospel, they'll say, yeah, give me some of Jesus too. But what does God say about that? No, no, no. I am the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. One way, not many ways. The New Age movement says he was a wise moral teacher. But again, if he's God, that makes him a liar. And wouldn't that discount you from being moral? The Mormons say he is a son of God, not the second member of the Trinity, pre-eternal. And you too have the same potential to become God. Like God the Father, like God the Son, like God the Holy Spirit, all three gods because they're all the same species that we are, so therefore you too can become God of your own planet. Not what Scripture teaches. The Jehovah's Witness say Jesus was not divine and not part of the Trinity. To the point in their translation of the Word of God, they've added a modifier. They've added a modifier to John 1.1, where in John 1.1 it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God referring to Christ. They've added a little modifier, and you think, what? 
little things don't matter, they matter. They've added a modifier, so they read it as, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Oof. Notice that when you look at even all these different theological perspectives, and I would define theology as what do you say about God? When you look at these theological perspectives, notice none of them denies the existence of Jesus. They can't do that. There's too much historical evidence. But they all love the Jesus of their own imagination versus the Christ of Scripture. Grace Hill Church, my challenge to you this morning is love the Christ of the Bible. Stop loving the Jesus of your imagination. He's calling you to be his and for you to call him Lord. So who do you say Jesus is? Let me leave this with you today. Found this in an article out of the Gospel Coalition. And it says, in the mid-19th century, the Scottish, the Scottish Christian preacher, Rabbi John Duncan, who lived from 1796 to 1870, formulated what he called a trilemma. It's in his book, and I'm going to murder it, Caliqua Peripatesia, page 109. It says, we see Duncan's argument. It says, Christ either one deceived mankind by conscious fraud, or two, he was himself deluded and self-deceived, or three, he was divine. There's no getting out of this trilemma. It is inexorable. And we see the same argument in 1936 by Watchman Nee, who had some bad theology himself. But he made a simpler argument in his book, Normal Christian Faith. It says, a person who claims to be God must belong to one of three categories. First, if he claims to be God and yet in fact is not, he has to be a madman or a lunatic. Second, is he is neither God nor a lunatic, he has to be a liar, deceiving others by his lie. Third, if he's neither of these, he must be God. So you can only choose one of these three possibilities. If you do not believe that he's God, you have to consider him a madman. You know, there's no need for us to prove if Jesus of Nazareth is God or not. All we have to do is find out if he's a lunatic or a liar. And if he's neither of those, he must be God in the flesh. And probably the most notable was C.S. Lewis's writings in Mere Christianity. He wrote in 1952, gave the argument its most memorable formulation and this is C.S. Lewis. He said, I'm writing here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him being Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a good moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil in hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something else. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit him out and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Now it seems to me obvious he was neither a lunatic nor a friend. And consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. So how about you? Who do you say Jesus is? 
If you've been saying anything, but he was pre-eternal, second member of the Trinity, who lived a perfect, sinless life, fully as God, fully as man, died a brutal death on the cross, was resurrected on the third day, and ascended to heaven and is now seated at the right hand of the Father because it's finished, because that's what he said on the cross. If you've been saying anything other than that, you're worshiping a God of your imagination. You're not worshiping the Christ of Scripture. If that's where you're at today, you need to repent. You need to put your faith and your trust in him, in him alone, because he is the only way the one way to the Father. Because he is about calling you and changing and transforming lives today. And perhaps there's some of you that are just in a rough patch. Perhaps you need to go back to your call. When God called you to be his, you remember, God, I see what you did for me here when you called me to be yours, I see what you did for me here and here and here. And I'm gonna call you Lord and trust you even in the hard things. Even in the hard things of today. The band's gonna come and we're gonna pray. I just encourage you as we take communion this morning to pray. Maybe you've never put your trust in Christ. Don't wait. Do that today. Put your trust in him. We don't need to lead you in a prayer here today. You just need to repent. Tell God that I'm going to put my trust in you. I'm going to call you Lord of my life. And allow him to change and transform you. So we're going to come This morning as we take communion, what a picture. As we see Christ's body broken for you. We see his blood shed for you. Again, showing that he's Lord. That again, before you come this morning, maybe there's things that you need to to repent of, you need to ask forgiveness for, so that you can come to the table with clean heart and clean hands declaring him as Lord and Lord alone, nothing else. Father, we come before you this morning. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, how we can be broken before you. Lord, thank you for the clarity of scripture and how you declared yourself as Lord. Lord, that you were more than a good person, more than a moral teacher. You were God in the flesh. Father, this morning, for each one of us, Lord, you would rip the blinders off that we might see you more clearly, that we would see you fully as Lord of our life. Lord, thank you that how you pluck us out of the darkness and into your light. Lord, we ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.